I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. Nate's come out with another awesome tool for the swimming community. It's called Swim Nerd Live and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone or other device. It has all the information you're looking for, event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more. All right. Laura Soga, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you for having me on. It's great to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. This is a, this is a fun one for me because <laughs> you have the usual standard um, story of, of somebody that I would interview. You know, you, you're an amazing high school swimmer. You went on to one of the best colleges in the country, had an incredible college career. Yep, <laughs> Texas. Just got back from there. And then... Um, you know, you had a, an international career where you swam for the U.S. and, and won yep. medals internationally. Um, and, and we can go into some of that for sure, but it's, it's really not my interest in you right now. Like my interest in you right now is like <laughs> the, the career beyond that is like you've done something unlike any other swimmer that I know. There may be others out there, but I don't know any other swimmers who've gone into uh, comedy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, well, ironically, I'm probably dating one of the only other ones who did, Matthew Broussard, not on, uh, love him, but not on our scale. You know, <laughs> He was the, the manager at Rice and swam at, uh, swam Atlanta actually, which is oh, kind right. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but absolutely. I think that that change, that kind of next step was, uh, something that's a, hopefully a little bit more unique to me. Um, I write some jokes about swimming, so that's kind of fun. It's been a, very, very niche those topics are, but uh, I find them very funny. <laughs> well, look, I wanna, yeah, I want to dig into that a little bit in terms of writing jokes because uh, my one of my loves outside of the pool and outside of watching swimming and, and analyzing it and all that sort of stuff is is comedy. So I've I kind of got into and MMA. So I got into MMA and comedy a little bit through kind of Joe Rogan and yeah. um, you know Brandon Schaub, the, these types of athlete comedian types and uh yeah. and so i kind of love that stuff uh so so but it, but those guys talk about the difficulty of comedy and and it really relates to athletics i think don't you yes a hundred percent um that's actually been one of the i i guess i didn't really realize going into this how similar in some regards doing comedy would be to training for a high level you know performance being in a pool 
um, for comedy, you have to go to what's called open mics, which are mm. a, a kind of akin to practice where you would go and you try out your new material and it's with just other comedians. There's in some cities, there'll be like people who go to watch. I truly don't know why those people do it. Cause these are always very, very bad <laughs> <laughs> because it's new, it's new material. And mm. even if some of the comedians are good, like something you think is funny, you say it on stage and you're like, Oh, that wasn't funny at all. <laughs> like, whoops. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so it's it's really similar to going and like just getting your your butt kicked in a Saturday morning workout, and then you lick your wounds afterwards, and you're like, all right, how did I get better? What can actually come into a race? And then the races, I would say, are closer to, you know, um, performances where you actually right. do have an audience and you're trying to to do well. Now, as we all know, like the better you are, the more those races can include and incorporate some um element of like learning you know versus just kind of being blacked out and like doing your absolute best but going mm -hmm. strictly to muscle muscle memory yeah um but yeah so so reality is i mean half of comedy is showing up and grinding and i don't know if you know this swimming has a lot of that as well <laughs> did you um did you feel like at at some point um your swimming career like you had to figure out the why of, of what you, why you were swimming kind of thing. And, and I'm sure that's translated, <laughs> that's translated into the why of comedy too, right? Like, did you have those questions uh, in swimming? Listen, all we do is pay taxes and die one day. Right. So you may as well laugh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no, no, I think, I mean, we're digging right into it for, for me, I got the opportunity, frankly, to swim for the United States. Um, a lot of different world university games, uh, went to world championships, like all the different kinds of meets, not the Olympics, which I do write jokes about now. <laughs> um, but the point was identifying why I was swimming past college was something mm. I really struggled with, I think. Um, and it's it's interesting because ultimately you're just looking at the bottom of the pool, but, but it is this amazing community that you get to build. The nice part about living in New York is a lot of the folks who I, you know, competed against like Andrea Kropp, who got third at the trials that I got fourth. She it lives five minute walk from me now oh, here wow. in Brooklyn. And I see her all the time. Rachel Nareth, um, Kaya Simmons, like all of these girls who I was on teams with growing up that weren't even at the same, you know, college as me. We're all in the same city now. And um, it's been, it's been really cool to be able to see my why, my why when I was swimming was a little bit more performance oriented in the sense that I wanted to be the fastest I could be. Obviously that's always a huge goal and to qualify for various competitions. But now when I look back on it, my why has evolved quite a bit because the relationships that I built over the course of those years, have they really enrich my life tremendously now. Mm -hmm. uh, I will for the like, you know, years and years to come. So it's evolved. Um, and I think with comedy, it's, it's also similar. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly why you do it. You know, it's right. fun uh, performing and doing well and getting laughs. Uh, it's a little addictive kind of like if you go best time you're like i want to do that again mm. um you enjoy the people you're around uh you get to try really hard for a goal which is you know something that you're maybe uniquely positioned to be able to do like you have a maybe a talent that you can nurture uh and then i don't know but the point is that i think that in five years from now i might have a completely different answer <laughs> well let's go back to your swimming real quick i mean you wh where did you grow up Rhode Island with, uh, I was on Bluefish Swim Club with Elizabeth Beisel, who just did her uh, swim for can uh, block cancer swim. Yep. I don't know if you saw that. Raised like $130,000 yeah. for cancer research. And like, I've known her since I was eight years old. So it's like absolutely incredible to be able to look at these people who I like grew up with. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like, that's amazing. Yeah, and she didn't honor her stuff. dad. And I was like, so it's really, really cool. I mean, that relationship that I have with her is worth more, you know, to me now than my best time in the hunter fly. Like, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> were you two the same age growing up? She's a year younger than me. So we're in the same training group. Right, right. Yeah. So um, you, you put some yards in then in that group. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of time to stare at a black line and just kind of think. <laughs> yeah well well uh, you you weren't uh, afraid of hard work then because you were no. doing so, so. <laughs> no uh chuck really got i think a couple of those practices kind of you know it breaks your brain a little <laughs> bit where afterwards you're like 
I don't even care. Like, whatever. Like, <laughs> this may as well happen too. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So then why did you end up uh, choosing Texas? Where, where did you go to visit in schools? Yeah, I visited. I mean, I was really lucky. I think the, um, they were looking for breaststrokers that year and I was mm-hmm. a breaststroker and I had just finaled at trials um, at like 17. So it was like perfect storm for me. I had the opportunity to um, take trips to Stanford, Cal, USC, University of Arizona, and University of Texas. And um, they're all obviously incredible. Like I was very, very lucky to be able to consider going to any of them. Really came down between Stanford and Texas for me. At that time, um, it was Kim Bracken and Lee Maurer who were the the head coaches there. Mm-hmm. So it's been, a, it's been some time since. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, I'm getting old. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've moved on. <laughs> yeah, they've moved on. Exactly. Um, but one of the things that sold me the most on Texas is obviously Eddie being there is, is fantastic. And like the legacy around it, like I really loved the, the, the history and the tradition around the program. I think on the other side, frankly, is um, I, I loved the school. I loved Austin, the city of Austin and how, um, I mean, now it's, it's pretty clear, but at that time there was this vibrant energy um, that was, they were building something really amazing there. Mm. And um all the, the startup companies are obviously, you know, have moved there since then. And, and people, other people have recognized that it's a pretty cool place to be. But at that time, it felt like kind of like I was in the, you know, kind of discovering a little bit of a gem. Granted, I'm sure I was 10 years behind a lot of other people who figured it out first. The other side is I went to school originally for, um, I, <laughs> it's so funny. I thought I wanted to do chemical engineering. Oh God, like, wow. What's wrong with me? I, I guess I was addicted to just the hard thing. I don't know. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so I went into the program and I, uh, they have a really, really, really good program, but it took me about a year and a half to realize that if I completed that program, I would be in an oil field somewhere. <laughs> I don't know if you're getting that from my personality, but <laughs> this is not an oil field kind of persona. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> so did not do that. Well, what did you end up getting into then? I did, uh, economics and business. So I do tech sales for a cybersecurity company now, and it's a pretty, Strong fit. It's been fun. Was there uh, a transition period for you between, um, you know, figuring out what you wanted to do with your life? Like, you know, you went into kind of some professional swimming after college. You went into that pro ranks a little bit. Um, When did you feel like you'd had enough of the swimming and wanted to move on with the rest of your life? Yeah, I always, um, I, I, it was kind of nice because I had that very clear three-year window in which the next Olympic trials, the next Olympic cycle was going to come around. Mm. And for me, I was pretty clear that I was like, after that, I'm I'm ready to to move on. Um, I don't know if my answer would be different had I actually had I made the team. Um, it was a right. really interesting meet for me, but um, once I got to that meet, I was like, yeah, I'm 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 ready to do something else. Love my experience swimming, obviously tons of great things to say about it, but I was also like ready to uh, try and apply all these amazing skill sets that I developed during that time to another endeavor. And uh, you asked, when did, when did I figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life? Yeah. Still figuring that out. You know? yeah, yeah, <laughs> does, never, does anyone really know? Like, it never I ends, I, does I it? I think you don't ever figure it out. <laughs> no, no. I started a podcast at uh, what, 45. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still figuring it out. Whatever. I have two podcasts. I'm going to do a podcast. <laughs> well, while we're on that, what are your podcasts so people can get, check them out? Yeah, go check them out. Um, two different ones. One is, they're very different. Um, one is with my boyfriend, Matthew Broussard, who I live with. He, it's on, uh, he's a professional comedian. He's been on The Tonight Show, uh, Comedy Central, like does it for money, which please go watch his clips so he can pay rent. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's called Cheetah Stand Up 2. And it's basically about when I started comedy a few years ago, he was already an established comedian. So it's inherently a little bit awkward, you know, um, having me kind of bumble around in the the really like, big, you know, learn to swim program equivalent of comedy. And um, kind of some of the lessons that I learned and I would get his perspective on it through it. So if you're into stand up, it's very niche in the stand up, New York specifically stand up world, which is absolutely insane. My other podcast is a little bit more widely accessible. It's on it's on business news. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> With a really good friend of mine who also works in the tech world and is a stand up comedian, um, Mae Planner. And we do um, 
weekly stories about scandals in the business world. So we covered, you know, the, the, I don't know, the uh, Malaysian prime minister who got all that, you know, stole all that money. Um, John McAfee, the story mm. of his life, which is absolutely insane. We just did an episode on the Facebook files, a bunch of Wall Street Journal articles that came out like last week. Uh, point is, it's we explain business news in a way that's digestible for people. You know, we're not professionals, so we say it pretty simply. I don't know, I don't know what a professional is either, you know, yeah. but, uh, but that's good. That's that's awesome that Fun. you have interests, you know, that um, you can connect with other people on, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's been a lot of fun being able to kind of um, – swimming is – awesome but it's so body driven and like if you hurt yourself then you're it doesn't really matter how much you've tried like if your knee hurts if you injure yourself you're you're out right mm -hmm. whereas i mean i guess that's technically true if you like got a concussion or something but like with your brain and with your your time management you can kind of push the envelope so much further on these other you know projects that you're doing and that's been something i've really enjoyed is not having to rely on my aging body, <laughs> but being able to use the hard work and stuff and on another thing, which I'm sure, I mean, it's, you clearly are doing as well. You know? Well, you know, I, I've taken a lot of the work ethic from, from the pool into this side of things. Cause this, yeah. this takes work and, and to have, have two podcasts, incredible. So um, I don't think people <laughs> realize how much goes into it, you know, mm -hmm. that's wild. But um, are your friends surprised by this um, kind of career that you're kind of into? Maybe not as much as they should be. <laughs> Why, were you funny in, in college? Like, did, did people oh, like, oh, yeah, you were, you were the jokester? I was, it's not that I was funny, but I, I certainly thought I was funny. And my friends were all like, we were all very similar sense of humor. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a, a term adults may have used about us would be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I always loved stand-up comedy. I thought it was the best. I used to go on LimeWire which if you recall, it was like the, that Napster file sharing service that they had that no longer, I don't think it exists anymore, but basically I would type in comedy central and download all the um, half hours that they had available. This is before Spotify or YouTube, where you could just find anything online, download probably a half dozen viruses to my family's PC and listen to them, <laughs> you know? So, so I was really, really into it from a, a young age. I just never thought that I, I there was a disconnect to me between who is saying the jokes and that you can just kind of become that person. Sorry. Right. 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 So I, um, I didn't know that I could do it. And when I met Matthew, I was like, apparently you can just do this. I also did improv in, um, while I was swimming. So, oh, okay. So you had had some experience even before you met Matthew. Yeah. 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 I've been wow. doing improv for like two years at that point. Improv is like, if you don't know, do you know what improv comedy is? Uh, to me, uh, to me, improv is just you get up and 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 talk sure. to the crowd, isn't it? Uh, so that might be closer to stand up. So stand up is where you have your, it's one person on stage, microphone, and they're telling jokes, right? Right, right. Improv is a team of people about. Oh. It could be you know as little as two up to eight or so, mm. and you're doing. Um, think of it kind of like plays that you're making up on the spot there's wow. structures and different games and things that you would kind of try to hold it to but for the most part it's just kind of made up and uh, is, there, is there like a tv funny. show that was that was on was um that whose line is it anyway right yeah that's the one. yeah so they play a bunch of improv games in that okay. so it's it's very different than stand-up but it does have performance aspects of being on stage and things like that so i did that it's also um way more time friendly like there's a there's a you know, you go to a class that's from like seven to nine and you meet your people and you do that. And then there's a show at the end of the class, blah, blah, blah. Versus stand up mm. is a build your own adventure. There's no such thing as a stand up team. You have to just piece together a schedule. It's like if you had your individual training schedule that you put together based on pool times that you could find and meets that you could sign yourself up for by or know someone who could get you in or whatever. Whereas right. a, like improv is just a pretty strict like this is how things are done the improv seems a little more of a security blanket is am i right in yeah. that or not okay. i 
I mean, I'm sure that there's, you can do indie versions where you do it yourself and it becomes less secure, right. but like a lot of the times they're coordinated via theaters. So the theater will have improv classes, which are so fun. Like, don't get me wrong. It's awesome to kind of get your feet wet and like get to know a few people in the, in the comedy world. A lot of people who do improv will also dabble in the standup world. Um, but it's very regimented compared to stand up is like a bunch of heathens uh, up till two in the morning <laughs> in a basement. Sometimes I look around and I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of heathens. Yeah. I'd get in there. That'd be good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, well, look, in, in terms of the swimming world, you you can recognize um, when someone has some talent and when somebody works hard. And then you can you can also see when someone has a little talent and great work ethic and puts them together and get some like you can get there in many different ways. 100 percent. It's not just about talent. It's not just about work ethic. But it, do you see the same thing in the comedian world? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. That's probably the closest um, parallel. And there are the people who are grinding and you are like, you are not naturally funny. And I right. so badly wish you were because you are clearly so passionate and trying so hard at this, but oh boy, you have so many things that you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. But what's crazy is sometimes they pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> How the heck you are. All right. Amazing. I'm so happy. Um, there's also so many other components beyond like, obviously with swimming, you're just measuring off of time right. and stand up success looks like so many different types of things. You know, it's, uh, do you have a lot of Instagram followers or like, do you do really well online? Are you a TikTok person? It, mm. it's, I have a really crazy world. <laughs> um, do you, are you a really good host? Do you perform regularly at clubs around the city? Do you perform around the country? Do you open for someone big? Do you have an amazing podcast? Like there's, it's kind of a build your own adventure sort of scenario to see right. what success looks like. That's probably also my, my favorite part about stand up is swimming is so heartbreaking in a lot of ways. Like mm -hmm. you obviously can go your best times and work really hard to achieve whatever goal you had for yourself that season. But ultimately a lot of the people who are in the professional ranks, their, their gauge of success is making an Olympic team. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. there's only two spots unless it's freestyle, which <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Point is there's limited spots and inherently it doesn't matter how talented everyone is. Um, like someone's not going. Right. And right. Um, which, which sucks when you all like did so well. And the nice thing with stand up is there's infinity pe or not infinity, but there's a lot of people who speak English, <laughs> you know, there's room for a lot of people to have really, really beautiful, big careers um in parallel with one another so i like a guy named uh, theo vaughn you know theo uh not personally but heard oh, of him yet right. See, yeah yeah, yeah I, I like him i just i, I kind of like his style i like the way he kind of creates his jokes i like his persona that he's, that he's created like is is that something that is recommended within the the comedian world of like figure out who you are and which direction you want to go like creating yeah. kind of a persona oh um, not that you have to have, I mean, your persona is ultimately like who you are and who you kind of, you know, what do you talk about on stage? Like, do you have a shtick? You right. don't want to be just, um, but some people could be generalists, but like for me, I'm obviously, uh, an athletic woman with an extremely competitive background living in New York city after failing to make an Olympic team. That's a pretty <laughs> unique brand. Right. <laughs> yeah. And as a result, the audience is like, Listen, we're not sure if we're laughing, but we're listening. That's for sure, because this, <laughs> this chick is nuts, and um, which is fun. You know what I mean? But, like, I guess having that, like, if someone's trying to describe you to another person afterwards, what are they going to say? You know? Right, right. And trying to influence that if you feel that it's important for for your personal brand and stuff like that. There's a, there's Seriously, you could just do a whole marketing thing on what the comics have to do at this point. It's a whole... It's a whole mess and dealing with the algorithms and all that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems super competitive, too. It seems like there's a lot of people out there trying to do the same yeah. thing. Incredibly competitive. Yeah. Incredibly competitive. And New York City is the most, I would argue, competitive. Maybe London? Though London has more stage time, I think. Like, New York is probably one of the most competitive scenes in the world. 
New York and LA, those would be the two spots that I would say are the hardest to do stand-up comedy. And then also some of the best places to do stand-up comedy, because if you can make it here, you're going to, you know, be really good compared to other cities where, you know, that there's just less competition. It's, know, nice, it's, it's, it's nice to have a boyfriend who's doing the same thing and, and supporting you through this and helping you grow through this. But is there, is there a, a kind of a, a, a group of, of comics that kind of support each other as well? Like, is it, when yeah. you say competitive, I, I think of competitive as being very cutthroat and it's like, I'm against you and you're against, like, is that competitive nature in the, in the world that you're in? No, it's a little bit, it's kind of nice because it's more competitive against, um, it's more collaborative. You right. know what I mean? Um, the people like you mentioned, like, it's obviously nice that Matthew does it. it. It's frankly not super relevant for me at this point. It's not that it hurts, but our levels are so disparate that I'm not getting on the tonight show yet. I've been doing this for only a handful of years. You know what I mean? So those connections or whatever are not useful for me right now. I'm trying to get on a local bar show or, you know, get passed at a random, like I do spots at various clubs, but like lower level spots. That's just where I'm at in my career. So to your point, the community of folks that I, um, that I go to open mics with and stuff like that, that's absolutely, uh, I guess you could probably say it's like closest to your college team where you technically would compete with them. Um, but ultimately the better they do, the better you're going to do. And you kind of build each other up at the same time. It's really nice. Like if you're booked on the same show as someone you're competing with, your goal is to make the same people laugh. And it's right. not like they only have 20 laughs and they have to distribute them. They can <laughs> laugh really hard at everyone, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit more, um, you know, collaborative in that sense. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of situations where people get maybe cut throw or things like that. Mm. Um, those, those are a little bit more nuanced though, rather than the, the overall, you know, culture is, is not, stepping on people talk to me about the levels then because in swimming you you know you see a high school kid and you're like all right through maturity and growth and 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 just putting yourself in a situation where you're in a group you know you go to texas and you're going to get better and right. then over, over the years you're going to get better and then and then the next level is you know you're going to compete at ncaa's in the finals and then the next level of that is you're going to compete you know at the world world university games and then you know, possibly go on to the Olympics and then maybe make a final. And, you know, there's steps. We, we know the steps and we know the progressions. We know how to get there. You just talked about being on a different level than, than Matthew. So, like, what what are the progressions that you need to take? Help me understand the, the levels. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's no, like, swimming is nice because it's it's just time-based, you know? So it's, it's a little bit more linear. So in stand-up, there is definitely the ability to kind of, like, you know, jump around. It's a little bit less of a just straight path up, right? Mm. And you can go ups and downs and maybe you tweet the wrong thing. It canceled and you go all the way back down here. Just <laughs> to up. You know, so it's a little bit more ambiguous. But the, the basic levels are, say, if whoever random wants to start doing stand-up comedy, they're going to start a level one, which is open mics. Open right. mics are inherently open. Anyone can go to them. You just go and you search on your local Facebook group or what comedians love Facebook. I have no idea why they, they're mm. obsessed with it. Um, see a Facebook group, find some open mics, go do your jokes, probably get no laughs. That's level one. Then as you kind of get, you know, you keep showing up, you keep trying your jokes. Eventually maybe you get a little bit funnier. Maybe you get a couple laughs from the comics that are there. Um, repeat, repeat, repeat until maybe you get booked on a bar show, you know, or some like little, little small show that one of the comics there runs. And that's a big thing is like the opportunities that are being made are often being made by the people, you know, it's like if you were to host, like if someone who wants to swim in a swim meet just puts on a swim meet themselves, you right. know? Yeah. <laughs> they're like host your own swim meet. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. And um, like I did that, I, I still do that. I do a lot of production where I'll produce shows in Brooklyn or Manhattan and book the guests or book the comics, um, promote the show, arrange it with a venue, get audience to come. Ta-da, there's a show. Right. So, so getting on those kinds of shows would be kind of the next stage is the open micers trying to, um, you know, show me in that case, because I'm producing that they're funny enough that I should put them on the show. So on the, so forth. So there's like kind of a networking component that comes into play. You keep doing that. You maybe run your own show. You maybe um, 
start a podcast and ultimately you kind of want to start reaching people who are outside the comedy community or people who you're not seeing just on a day-to-day basis because, you know, you don't want to physically restrict the people who are, you know, getting access to your content to someone who is just happens to be at the same bar as you on a Tuesday night. Right. right. So there comes the online element to it. Um, keep going. You might do TikToks. You might do Instagram reels. You might do uh, your podcast, whatever it is. And eventually, hopefully you'll get past it at a club. That's always a pretty big deal. Like I, I got past at Stand Up New York, which was really exciting. Uh, and that means that those are, you know, professional establishments where they book comedians to come and entertain club goers, like pretty straightforward, right? right? So then you kind of hopefully move up those ranks, get past at more clubs. Um, in New York, we have probably somewhere between eight to 10 different clubs um, in the city. So it's, it's a fair amount. And um, if you're doing well there, uh, maybe you also are doing well in the indie scene, the alt scene, and you get passed and get on late night television, which is really exciting. That'll mm-hmm. expose you to a bunch more people. Uh, Comedy Central, maybe you'll take notice and put you on a, you know, give you a special, give you a 10 minutes or half hour, Netflix, HBO. And that's kind of like the progression from there. Right. So as you can tell, say your podcast blows up, that's a completely alternate route that might kind of impact the rest of that. But that's the basic kind of flow chart. Right, right. Now, Matthew is up here in the Comedy Central, you know, that side of things where, you know, his he's really good. (laughs) Yeah. And I'd imagine that someone like him has gone through the progressions in a natural sense. And it's taken him, you know, 10 years to kind of get to that point. But he's there and and he's established. Then you would have the ones that have been in the game forever. And then finally something clicks and, 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 you know, 20 years down the line. And then I guess you would have kind of like the freaks of nature who go from here to there extremely fast. They, they would be rare, but is there, the, is there that special talent that is known out there in the comedy world of like, man, that kid just went. Whew. Yeah. And I mean, realistically, you know, on occasion, it'll be someone who's just like so exceptionally funny that that happens to happen. Right. The reality is like, it's kind of like in swimming. They're all really freaking funny. Um, what will happen in that situation more is they blow up because something went viral online oh, okay. for whatever reason. And that's a catch 22 because to a certain extent you want, as I've been told, don't get me wrong. I have no idea. I'm clearly, you know, a newbie here, but from what I've observed from other comedians and what I've been told, um, the rep, you, the reps that you're doing over those years prepare you for difficult situations that may occur right. later on down the line, mm-hmm. handling an unruly audience, handling um, nerves before a big performance. Um, it's kind of like you don't want your first swim meet to be your first big swim meet to be the Olympics, right? Right. Yeah. Ideally not. If it happens, you know, Godspeed, do your best. <laughs> yeah. Um, but ideally you're going to have, you know, maybe competed at finals at some other competition internationally before then. So then you, you mentioned that. What are the similarities between walking out for the Olympic trials and walking out to a comedy routine? I, it was it used to drive me, like it made me laugh so much is if I would get nervous before going on stage, I would subconsciously start going into my stretching routine. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Oh my God. <laughs> That's serious. That's so I'd be like, behind, like on the, in the green room or like kind of like off to the side, mm. like doing like my, like, you know, arms across. And, like, and, the, and the comics are like, what the yeah. fuck is this <laughs> yeah, Are you good? I'm like, I don't know. I just need to be loose. <laughs> You're going to be like, all right. That's hilarious. Um, so, so that's similar. You can drink. So that's a very different. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> true too. Beer before you go on stage, not advised at a swim meet. Right. Technically right. you can do it, but mm-hmm. I think, I don't know. <laughs> um, and um, the reality is for comedy, if you're, there and you're having like the audience is feeding off of your emotions and the stuff that you're telling to them. And you're, it's a conversation between you and this group of people that's in front of you. So humans are really good at picking up on stuff. So you can like, when you're watching a meet, you know, if you watched like Michael Phelps, it's very clear how focused and like game face on he is for comedy. It's half acting. I mean, it's a lot of acting even if I'm freaking out internally, I don't have the luxury of showing that to the audience because it that's impacting the performance. Right. You know what I mean? So you have to go up there and be like, hey, good time, you know, like whatever your persona is and, you know, mm. lean into being, like in my case, I'm pretty bubbly and relaxed and um, 
I'm a, I'm not a very serious, you know, hard hitting political comedian or something like that. So uh, if I went up there was super like tense, they would pick up on that and it would make my performance worse. It would make it not be as. I was going to say that. Yeah. Like, cause you know, I hear comedians talk about um, going up and bombing and then going up and having a great night. But yeah. you know, if you're presenting the same material, why would you bomb if the material is great? I don't understand that. That's probably goes to what you're just saying there. Oh, listen, I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> like, oh, really? Is, no, you're, what you're saying is like drags me insane because you'll go to one audience, you'll do your jokes. Yeah. You think you did them pretty similar. The words are, you know, the words get pretty carved out and nothing. They'll get nothing. Then you'll go to another show and they'll crush. And you're like, wow. What? Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah, why? And there's, it's because there's infinity other nuances around the scenario and that's your job as a comic is to kind of start learning like oh you know this audience was tired because it was like really late at night or hey this is a wednesday early show so maybe they're still like figuring out work and they're going to be a little bit different energy than the saturday night late crowd right you have to kind of adjust your performance for each of them maybe i didn't engage enough with the audience up top and get them to kind of really feel connected to me mm. um maybe i should have done more crowd work you know when i was working with them um there's a lot of different things there's no and there's no formula for it it's not like i mean like with swimming you think that you do the race exactly the way you've trained and then you can maybe go a time that you're not expecting and you're like uh, why yeah. <laughs> like i did yeah. i did everything like i was I trained right and it might be different and that's your job as you get older and more experienced to be able to see those changes and like what's actually happening and make adjustments accordingly or not you know the best swims we ever had I, i'd imagine the same for you because I, I talked to a lot of swimmers is the ones you really can't remember you just went up there and you let you let your body yeah. go the, the toughest ones were always the ones that you overthought that you were kind of everywhere you were thinking about all the different things that were going on other people's lanes the person next to you the, yeah you know it, it, i'm sure it's similar in comedy where you may have an experience where you come off stage and you're like wow that just that just came out of me is that right yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the sets that I, I feel like I've had the best um, rapport with the audience, I've just been, well, when I started, is having fun. Mm, <laughs> Sounds right. cheesy, but like relaxed and like really connecting with them. Um, the reality, I haven't been doing this in many enough years to really have what I would consider like a like that perfect five minutes for late night television, clean television worthy set. That's not where I'm at yet, um, level wise. But from what Matt's experienced, like, it seems like he kind of goes into that muscle memory state, especially for those high nerve situations and mm. is able to rely on his training, which is cheesy as it sounds. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. coming from the background you come from, a lot of it translates. So you're probably, yeah. probably fortunate. Um, it certainly well, helps. Also, okay. it's so funny because comedians, like I think inherently it's a lot of people who have weird backgrounds right? Mm, right they don't necessarily work corporate nine to five jobs so to be able to take that extreme discipline that we have from the pool and apply it to to comedy they're they think i'm insane <laughs> they think i am batshit crazy right right <laughs> because like you have two podcasts and you produce a i produce two different like it's a whole thing but i just know how to bang out work you know what i mean yeah. like like list of tasks just knock it all out right and it's something we learn when you have about 45 seconds to do homework before whatever your next practice or something. Do you want to be doing this full time or are you happy to be, you know, doing it kind of part time at the moment? Um, I think I've kind of accepted that I want to just be doing. So with swimming, I really, really didn't like towards the end of my career having to focus on swimming for like money can right. you hear me? yep can you hear me okay good um i i didn't like having to take this thing that was something that i really loved doing and make it um my my job right um and with comedy i don't want to ever put myself in a position that what i really enjoy right now is performing and the community and stuff like that i don't necessarily want to have to rely on that financially mm. so what I'm doing right now is working really hard to kind of build other areas where I could potentially not need to necessarily focus on having 
you know, a strict source of income coming from, from comedy. Um, is that complicated to do? Yeah. You got to work really hard. Tech startups, um, you know, a couple moonshots out there and <laughs> see how it all goes, goes together. But for the time being, I, I really like kind of working both of them in, in tandem with one another. Ultimately, it'd be great to get a job within, you know, like adjacent enough to the comedy world that I wouldn't have to do like the gig economy of booking stuff to, to piece 1099s together, but have some sort of like maybe a writer's job or in production or something along those lines. Um, but I also really love my work in the tech world. So I don't know. It's kind of a day by day thing. <laughs> Fair enough. I like it. I, I mean, I got tons of other questions, so I'm going to dive into them. So yeah. there's comedy and then there's swimming. And then within swimming, there's breaststrokers like you, there's freestylers like me, there's um, men and women. Um, so in the, in the comedy world, do you, is there, is there a style of, of where you see yourself as a breaststroker in the comedy world? Is there people like you that you study, that you analyze, that you maybe compete against? Like, would people put you in a bracket like that and say, she's there with all, with these other women? Yeah. It's weird because <sighs> swimming, obviously you compete against the different, like the gen in comedy. First of all, there's very few women. Like yeah. very few, which yeah. is kind of nuts. I, why, I why is that? Um, that's a very, that's a very, that's a question a lot of people have asked. I think um, open mics can, as you can imagine, get a little bit aggressive sometimes. And what I mean by that is not exactly welcoming to, you get a bunch of 22 year old guys trying to be funny, mm. you know, late night, and maybe it doesn't exactly make the most appealing environment for, for young women of the, right. you know, in the same group, not necessarily. And there's plenty of women like myself included, obviously who have gone through it. Um, but I think it's like, over, in the, in the attempts to be funny, a lot of the times, some of this material that comes up might kind of be, a, not, I don't want to say that it's all offensive, but like, if you're not used to that kind of, uh, mm. stuff, it's, it's a lot, right? Yeah. So there's that, that's one, um, that combined with the fact that I think that women are, um, not they don't know they can do stand-up comedy. There's not that many like really big female stand-up comedians. And that's because freaking, we just got the ability to work in an office. I think we're focusing on that for a second. That's a, <laughs> as a group. You know, we just got the office about 25 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's one thing at a time. Um, unless you're like me and you're like, do it all. <laughs> Nuts. Um, so there's that. And so then just having like the female role models, like I would say a lot of the stuff I joke about is I don't, I'm a pretty ironically clean comedian. <laughs> I don't really do like a bunch of sex jokes or, you know, anything. I don't do race. I definitely don't do race jokes or politics. So a lot of the stuff I talk about ends up being like kind of weird, or um, maybe it's a little like based on relationships or based on my observations, or obviously I do talk a lot of, about business and I don't really know who would match that in, you know, there's not necessarily a group like that out right, there. Right, right. So I don't like have, I don't think it's really as delineated as that. You can start getting to, there's like LA comedians and New York comedians and those kinds of our brackets. And they have different mm. cultures that come with them. New York comedians are insane. They're so focused. They're so joke heavy. Like it has to have a really good joke. Their delivery may be completely deadpan, but the jokes are like unreal, like mental riddles or like they're uh -huh. fantastic. Whereas LA comedians will be super performance based and amazing characters and really, um, you know, being there and being able to watch like the whole thing really adds to how funny it is. Um, comedians in Chicago, absolutely amazing. They have a lot of a strong improv background there. So maybe they riff more. I'm kind of making that up. But, but you see like, so the yeah. reality and that's more just like, who's the team that you've been around, right? Who yeah. are the people and the, the influences locally that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? Super interesting. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I find it fascinating. No, it's um, very interesting. I, I don't, uh, I could never imagine myself attempting to do that. I, I, would, I would just, it would be the worst kind of fear of, of all time for me. People are so scared of it. Yeah, it's, it's and I mean, I don't blame them when you're up there and you're bombing. You're like, this is 
miserable. <laughs> the other day I asked an audience if they had personality. Oh, wow. How'd they take it? They didn't love that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they had them though. Oh, shit. Yeah. It it's funny. What about in terms of like, uh, there, there's different styles of the way coaches write workouts. Uh, I'm sure there's different styles in terms of the way comedians write jokes. How, how have you gone about it? Oh gosh, that's a great question too. For me, um, man, you want to write about yourself or you don't want like, so you don't want to write easy jokes like that people that other people may have also written. Um, you're going to, when you first start, you're inherently, you're absolutely going to come up with a joke that someone else has. Yeah. And, How do you know? Does someone let you know? Um, someone might let you know if they're nice. Um, it might, you might see them at some point and be like, Oh sh shoot. You know? Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Like that's like really where like being around the community and kind of seeing everyone helps you to kind of identify that if you mm -hmm. have done that. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you do, like it, there's different ways to handle it. Maybe your joke is different enough that you can kind of move it in a different direction and still do it. I usually just drop the joke mm -hmm. and do a different one. Cause I don't want to have something that's going to even, I, I just want it to be more original to me, right. um, which is why it's really helpful to write about your own experiences and things that are unique to your life, because how is somebody going to have the same stuff as you? Right. So I'm lucky in that I've had a lot of really unique situations <laughs> in my life. Um, for me, it's more difficult to kind of explain the context to the audience in a really fast format. That's not off putting. Um, Cause talking about being a professional swimmer is not necessarily the most relatable topic right. <laughs> throughout the game. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so my style of writing, reflecting on my life and just things that I find are funny, kind of figuring out how I can word them in a way that would evoke laughter from an audience, you know, observations that you might be like, huh, like, why is, why is that? And then, you know, then the structure of how the joke is written and stuff like that, that's where you fix all the other stuff. But the core premise is, are you, uh, the premises is tough. Are you, are you typing this into a phone or are you pen and paper type person? What are you doing? Um, both. It really oh. depends. I have a notebook that I used to use it a lot, but then I, now I do more on my phone. You also try to record all of your sets. This is a big thing. You want to record them. If, um, and then you want to listen to them, Laura. I have so many recordings that I'm like, I recorded, and then I never listen to it again. Right. I'm like, that's not the point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the reason is because when you riff with the audience, like maybe if you ask them and they're like, I'm a lawyer, and you're like, you're, I'm a lawyer from Florida, and then maybe you do a bit about how crazy it would be to be a lawyer in Florida because of everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that bit could turn into a joke for you one day, right? Um, and if you get off stage and you don't have a recording or have written that down right away, you're going to forget immediately. So right. that's the other thing is always, if something comes up, write it down. And that way you can look at your notes and be like, I'm truly insane. Look at the, like my, I have the weirdest notes in here. Let's look, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like absolutely insane, you know, freedom of information laws in Florida. I'm apparently trying to write jokes. About. <laughs> <laughs> That's a starting point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know what I was going on with that, but I'll circle back. <laughs> when you say recording, do you mean like a voice or do you voice mean a tape? You, a you, don't, you, you don't ever watch tape back? No, people will also do that. So it kind of depends on the scenario. If you can set up your phone to take a video, then definitely that's the move. Um, sometimes it's not, maybe you don't want to leave your phone in the middle of the crowd you don't trust necessarily that it'll be there when you get mm -hmm. that down. So then you might take it up and then just do a voice memo and put it on the stool next to you. Okay. Uh, it kind of just depends. So is it uncomfortable for you to watch yourself back? Sometimes if I didn't do well, but sometimes when I do well, I'm just like, you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> just you like any race. You know, if you, if you watch a race where you just like eat it at the yeah. end, you're like, Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't want to relive that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then so what's coming up for you then? Where, where are you, where, where's the next frontier? What are you doing? Well, I'm producing a bunch of shows. So if anyone listening wants to go to a show in um, New York city, I produce, um, you know, don't tell comedy here, which is a really, really amazing group of um, they're around the country. And I do the New York production for them. 
and then Brooklyn Underground Comedy. So um, pr producing those has been a really big focus for me. It's more stage time and it's it's fun to give performance opportunities to people and put on good shows. In terms of stuff that I'm doing is nurturing these podcasts, Risque Business News and Shoot a Stand Up too. Um, they've been really fun, you know, and we've been we've been growing them quite a bit. So have been um, enjoying learning about all the freedom of information laws and things like that uh, um, across the you know the, the fun stories that we can bring. Cool. I'm, I'm sure as a as a young streamer, you had dreams of going to a particular college, and then maybe in college you had dreams of maybe representing your country like we had goals we had visions for ourselves are you there now like what where do you see yourself that you may want to go is it you want yeah. to be on television whatever you know what is it for you um it's hard to i i know what you mean because like in swimming it's pretty clear you're like okay i want to make like you know this school yeah. or yeah. states or the olympics right it's yeah. like pretty linear for me, I would love, I mean, I, I'm so passionate about so many of my projects that I want all of them to like, I was like, I want to be on TV and I want to have a star podcast mm -hmm. and I want to have the best show in New York, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But, sure. um, but, but breaking that down into more, you know, bite-sized things, like any combination of, you know, success in any of those fields, I would consider something I'd be very, very, I'm already very proud of what I've been able to pull together, especially during COVID. COVID, we didn't even talk about that, really threw a wrench in this whole thing. Yeah, I saw you were trying to piece together some like outdoor events. Or what what we did was going so on? So much outdoor stuff. I can't tell you. I just had a call earlier today where we were talking about outdoor shows in the winter, and I was like, I'm not doing them. I'm not standing outside in 10 degrees anymore. No, not happening. They didn't make <laughs> you do, do it with a mask last... on, did they? Uh, we didn't perform with them. We. No, I don't think there ever was a period. The nice thing is you have a microphone, so you can stand even in the midst of it all. We were like, if you we're on the mic, you could be by yourself. And we just wiped the mic between people. <laughs> we actually, it was nuts. We did a pretty decent job there. Outdoor shows during that time. Yeah. And um, so all of 2020, basically we were outdoors. Or yeah. I had shows on the subway for a while. Oh, I did see some of those. Oh, yeah. it was insane. With State of New York. They were, it was a really <sighs> fun experience to learn. That's bold. But it was, uh, yeah, it was one of those no things. No one on the subway is happy. Yeah, well, well, the one thing that was different is we, the audience would meet the comedians beforehand and all go on the same car. So uh, there was a certain group of people who were aware there was going to be a comedy show and okay. they were in on the fun. But then obviously the other people who are on the, sh the car are like, what the hell's yeah. going on? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and either they are like, oh, ha ha. Or they're like, New York City. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that makes sense then. Okay. Yeah, it it yeah. freaked me out that you're even just going into a car and trying to be funny in front of these random people. I'm like, oh my God, that makes me person. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, I lost my mind. Not quite to that degree, but pretty close, you mm. know? Yeah. Um, so, so now, you know, now we're inside again and um, it's been pretty, it's been really wonderful being able to do, you know, normal shows. We have, strong vaccination rates here in New York. So um, everyone's been, you know, well-behaved and able to do that. So hopefully we keep that through the winter. Um, so I'm excited to just have like some, some heads down years of work on building my material set mm -hmm. and um, building the podcast and building the shows without a global pandemic in the mix. Yeah, <laughs> so that'll be a, what a, what a luxury. A lot of swim coaches feeling the same way. Oh, I, totally I, trust I felt so bad. For me, I have, you know, I can technically do stand up for the rest of my life if I if I really like if it comes to it. Hmm. For swimming, like those poor kids in college, what a oh, nightmare! Yeah, yeah, yeah. They missed all that last year. That was horrible. Yeah. yeah, I really felt for them. Yeah, um, we've all we've all got a favorite pool and a, maybe even a, a favorite performance that we remember that's just stuck in our head. Like, yeah, that that was the one. Is there a is there a comedy one for you yet like favorite venue and and favorite performance you can remember um probably not anything specific specific yet i will say um i, I got to do shows at olympic trials those were pretty fun oh, that was, really yeah i i um Wow. So USA Swimming has hired Matt for a couple different things. Um, to he hosted the Golden Goggles at one point, um, oh, or performed. Cool. Yeah, it was it was a, it's been fun. So we went out and we did the Deck Pass live stuff, and then we're doing some shows at the Jewel. And there was one where just a bunch of the Texas people came out, and it was um, 
was it one of my best performances ever? Definitely not. Was it, um, like, was it super, super fun? Right. Absolutely. Like, I think my jokes are far better by now than they were then even. However, it was just like really cool to be able to show a new talent that I've developed to my, to these people who saw me in this other world. So that was like special, you know? Right, right. You can yeah. tell the difference between like, I mean, we know as swimmers when we're getting better, you look back and you're like, oh, I'm so much better than I was a year ago. Like you can tell the difference as a comedian. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's so funny though, because day by day, obviously, I mean, it's just like in swimming where you look mm -hmm. back three months and you're like, I was, you know, did I do so many things different now, but if you look back one week, you might not be able to see that. Right, right. So it takes a couple months. And I guess in stand up, you also are like, oh, I wrote X, Y, and Z joke during that period. And those jokes are way better than the jokes I was doing then, which are garbage. Uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, so being able to see your material evolve, which just takes time. You know, it's yeah. tough to rush or yeah. so I've been told. <laughs> and we all had that kind of I'm, I'm done moment in swimming at some point, you know, like we wanted yeah. to quit. You wanted to quit and didn't. Have you had that moment in comedy yet? Not yet. I know I will for sure. I know I definitely will. But at this point, I'm still so like bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, that I'm like, like so infatuated with everything, awesome. um, which has been fun. But but I'm also so young into it that I and I've I'm old enough to realize like there will be periods where I'm going to, you know, not be as excited. And that's OK. You know, that's yeah. how anything goes when you do it long enough. It's all right. <laughs> cool. Go through periods. I love it. Well, look, I'm great catching up. Thanks for, yeah. uh, for doing this. This is interesting to me. So I'm so happy. I'm so happy that we were able to get connected and it's still so fun. Like there's so much support from this, the swimming world that I get for all my stand up stuff. So, well, hopefully we can get Thank some you. more now. This is, you know, yeah. I've got, I've got followers uh, worldwide. What's the, <laughs> what's the best way to connect with online with what you're doing? I would say following me on Instagram. I post yeah. a bunch of BS um, funny, fun things I find funny. So if you think I'm, you know, if we have similar senses of humor, you're going to like it. If not, uh, I apologize, but just, it's my name, Laura Sogar. Mm -hmm. And there's links there to my podcast as well. Awesome. Um, she does stand up too and risque business news. Um, and then they'll, there's various stand up clips from production, the you know, stuff that we've done. So Great. I'm going to show if you're in New York, seriously, they're really fun. And I book really funny comedians, way funnier than I am. So they're always a good time. Actually, I'm not far from New York. I live in Delaware. So let me know next time you're you're doing some. Give me a little heads up and I'll I'll try and get there. It's literally most weeks. So perfect. You know? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Well, listen, uh, get, give her a follow. Come on. She needs all the support she can get. Yeah, seriously. Um, get it out there. So <laughs> Laura, appreciate that. Thanks a lot for today. Thank you so much. It was so great being on. Have a good one, man. Take care. Bye.